Now, let us look at a few more properties of the discrete time Fourier transform. One important property is what happens when we multiply? That is in some sense dual to convolution. Let me explain the meaning of the word dual. So, in other words, if I have x 1 and 2 with DTFTs capital X 1 and 2, what is the DTFT of x 1 n x 2 n? That is the question that we ask. Now, I will spend a minute in explaining the idea of dual here. We are kind of for you know having a foregone conclusion, we are trying to use our intuition to come to a conclusion before we actually arrive there. There is one very common principle that is useful in many contexts in the Fourier transform, and that is that very often the roles of time and frequency can be reversed. Now, in continuous time and in analog frequency, this is exactly true. So, one can show that one can more or less exactly reverse the roles of time and hertz frequency in properties. However, in discrete sequences and the discrete time Fourier transform, this is true in a slightly more extended sense. It is not true obviously. For example, what we saw was that when we multiply, when we convolve two sequences, we are multiplying their discrete time Fourier transforms. Now, duality would tell us that you could reverse the roles of time and frequency. That means, that when you multiply two sequences, you expect some kind of convolution to take place in the frequency domain, but it is not obvious what kind of convolution that we will need to do with a little bit of algebra. We, need, we broadly understand that we expect some kind of convolution, that is what duality says, but we need to put down exactly what kind of convolution. To arrive at that answer, let us actually consider a product. So, here we are. So, consider the DTFT. Now, of course, we have assumed that both x 1 and x 2 have their own DTFTs and that this converges. We are assuming, otherwise it has no meaning to discuss. All that we do is cleverly replace one of them by their inverse DTFTs. So, we write down x 2 n for example, you could do it the other way too, but we will write down x 2 n as, now here we cannot write omega, because you already have an omega there we must use another variable of integration here. Let us use the variable lambda. Is that right? So, we simply replace one of the sequences by their in by essentially write the sequence as an inverse DTFT of its own DTFT. Now, we substitute that. So, here we are. That becomes summation n going from minus to plus infinity x 1 n by 2 pi integral minus pi to pi. And you see, we realize we realize that we could as well take the e raise the power minus j omega inside here. It does not do any harm at all. It is a constant anyway with respect to this. It is a constant with respect to lambda, so I can push it inside. And now, I can interchange the summation and the integration. And I can combine these two terms. 
and there I am. This becomes 1 by 2 pi integral from minus pi to pi summation on all n x 1 n e raised the power minus j omega minus lambda times n multiplied by x 2 lambda d lambda. So, here we have something very interesting. What we have inside the curly bracket here is essentially the discrete time Fourier transform of x 1 n, but evaluated at omega minus lambda instead of at lambda or at omega. You have just evaluated that discrete time Fourier transform at a different value. Is that correct? So, there we are. We are saying this is 1 by 2 pi integral from minus pi to pi capital X 1, but evaluated at omega minus lambda and X 2 lambda d lambda. And recognize that this is very similar to what you expect a continuous time convolution to be. So, it looks like a continuous variable convolution. There is only one little catch. A continuous variable convolution should have run all over the independent variable axis. So, here lambda is a continuous variable. So, it should have taken you all over the lambda axis, if you were to convolve the continuous functions capital X 1 and capital X 2. But you are restricting the convolution to one period. You have restricted the convolution to the period minus pi to plus pi. In fact, we do not really have to insist upon the interval minus pi to plus pi, even in the inverse discrete time Fourier transform. In the inverse discrete time Fourier transform, we can take any contiguous interval of 2 pi. So, if you are really very fond of it, we might take the interval from 0 to 2 pi instead of from minus pi to pi. That is because from pi to 2 pi, you have just the same thing that you have from minus pi to pi. If you are even more insistent on doing something unusual, you could start from pi and go up to 3 pi, whatever you please. Any contiguous interval of 2 pi is fine and that is true here as well. So, one must in general say in this expression that you need to calculate this integral over any interval, any contiguous interval of 2 pi. It could be from 0 to 2 pi, it could be from minus pi by 4 to 3 pi by 4 if you like, you know, or I mean, you know, whatever you, you prefer. So, my, or minus pi by 2 to 3 pi by 2, right. So, 3, I mean, I, it should be actually pi plus pi, by, 3 pi by 4. So, um, so, it could be from minus pi by 2 to 3 pi by 2, it could be from 0 to 2 pi, or it could be from minus 2 pi to 0, whatever you please. Any contiguous interval of 2 pi is fine, right. Anyway, this is what is called a periodic convolution. It is a periodic convolution of two periodic functions. Capital X 1 and capital X 2. Remember, both these DTFTs capital X 1 and capital X 2 are periodic functions. Now, if you did actually write down the expression of convolution as you have done here, but you tried to evaluate this integral going from minus to plus infinity, of course, that interval would die, that integral would diverge. 
because both of the functions are periodic, this would be a sum of the integral over every period and if any of them is non-zero, that sum would obviously diverge. So, it does not make any sense when you have two periodic functions to calculate the convolution by integrating over all the independent variable axes. It only makes sense to calculate over one period and that is exactly what we are doing here. Remember that in this expression, both x 2 of lambda and x 1 of omega minus lambda for any fixed omega are both, they are both periodic. Of course, x 2 lambda is periodic with period 2 pi, x 1 omega minus lambda is also periodic with period 2 pi and how do you get x 1 omega minus lambda from x 1 lambda? Let us just spend a minute in doing that. So, just to take an example, suppose you happen to have this from minus pi to pi for x 1 lambda. I mean let me assume for the moment that x 1 lambda has 0 phase. So, we will say that the angle of x 1 lambda is equal to 0 for all lambda and we have shown the magnitude here. Let us assume that this is the kind of x 1 lambda we are dealing with just for simplicity. How would x 1 omega minus lambda look? Essentially, it would look with this occurring at omega. And of course, always remember that you have periodic continuation here. There is periodic continuation there and there is also periodic continuation here. Also, whatever you see here, let us mark it as script A, is going to be seen as its own reflected version here. Let us call it A prime. And what you see here, let us call it script B, is going to be seen here, script B prime. There is also a reflection. You see, this can you can come to this conclusion in two steps. When you replace lambda by omega plus lambda instead of omega minus lambda, when you replace it by omega plus lambda, you are going backward by omega. And then when you replace lambda by minus lambda, you are making a reflection. So, what was at 0 would have gone to minus omega when you replace lambda by lambda plus omega. And then when you replace lambda by omega minus lambda, you are switching the lambda sign of lambda and therefore, what is at minus omega now comes to plus omega, what is after minus omega goes before plus omega and what is before minus omega goes after plus omega. And that is how we come to the conclusion that whatever was after this would now appear before this in reflected form, whatever is before this would appear after this again in reflected form. This is the relation between x 1 lambda and x 1 omega minus lambda. Now, let us take an example to illustrate this idea. Let us take the very simple discrete time Fourier transform, which is 1 between minus pi by 4 and plus pi by 4 and 0 else. And we will assume that the discrete time Fourier transform is 0 phase. 
So, in fact, let us take this to be both x 1 and x 2 of omega. Of course, x 1 and 2 omega plus 2 pi is equal to x 1 to omega for all omega. And we will assume that angle of x 1 to omega is equal to 0. So, essentially it is 0 phase and the magnitude is 1 between minus pi by 4 and plus pi by 4, 0 outside. Let us find out the inverse discrete time Fourier transform of this. All right. Now, of course, how do we find out the inverse discrete time Fourier transform? We multiply this pi raised to the power j omega n and integrate over omega from minus pi to pi, simple. So, we have x 1 or for that matter 2 n is integral from minus pi to pi x 1 respectively 2 omega e raise to the power j omega n d omega divide by 2 pi. And this of course, boils down to 1 by 2 pi integral from minus pi by 4 to pi by 4 1 e raise to the power j omega n d omega. This is a very easy integral to evaluate. In fact, it takes us only a minute to evaluate it. This simply becomes Now, please note, I have written this. Do we need to put a condition here? Yes, indeed. What is the condition? The condition is that n must not be equal to 0, provided n not 0. Now, when n is 0, what does it become? When n is equal to 0, this becomes 1 by 2 pi, and the integral is simply 1 d omega. So, essentially, pi by 4 minus minus pi by 4, which is pi by 2. Is that correct? So, therefore, this is valid only when n is not 0. So, there we are. So, x 1 or 2 n is 1 by 2 pi e raise to power j pi by 4 n minus e raise to power minus j pi by 4 n by j n for n not equal to 0. And it is very easy to see that this becomes sin pi by 4 n divided by pi n for n not equal to 0. And it is equal to pi by 2 divided by 2 pi for n equal to 0. Now, we ask what is the discrete time Fourier transform of x 1 n into x 2 n? What do we expect it to be? We need to convolve the discrete time Fourier transform of any one of them with itself. So, we take the lambda axis, we put here of course, we you know let us first just draw one of them. So, this is just one of them. And we can visualize the other. So, let us visualize the other.
and kind of expanding it a little bit. Let me draw them on the same on the same scale, so to speak. Now, what do we need to do? We need to multiply these two and to integrate over one period and we can choose that period to be between minus pi and plus pi. How much is this interval? This interval is pi by 2. So, let us assume that this tip has reached, you see now you must you see take the energy of the train and the platform, right. So, you have this the only catch here is now, you know, instead of the train having people standing at discrete locations, people stand all over the train. That is the continuous time situation, right. So, here we are, here this is, these are the people on the platform, these are the people in the train, omega moves, right. Now, suppose this point has reached here. What is the situation? You know, of course, this is going to be repeated at every multiple of 2 pi. But luckily, when this point reaches here, we the trouble would have come from the next such the next such square, isn't it? How far is the next such square? Two pi away from here. That's very far from. So it's even if even if this point is here, the next of these squares is not going to clash with this. Is that right? So what we are sure is that one time only one square clashes with one square here. That I leave it to you to verify. You will never have a situation where two such squares clash with this one square here. Okay, I leave it to you to verify that. That follows from the fact that you have only a pi by 2 interval of spread. Anyway, so what would happen as omega moves from a point where omega plus pi by 4 is equal to minus pi by 4. You see when omega, when this point is here, omega plus pi by 4 is equal to minus pi by 4. In other words, omega is equal to minus pi by 2. And you know, at that point, this, you know, so you can visualize, this comes here and it moves as omega moves in this way. So, you have more and more of this square overlapping with this square here or this rectangle. And as omega moves along this, the area increases linearly. The area is obviously equal to this height into the base which overlaps and that base increases linearly with time. So, right from the point where this is here up to the point where this has reached here, there is a, there is a linear increase, right. Afterwards, as this point you see, so I mean, well, well no, a slight correction right from the point where this has reached here up to the point where this. So, let us go back to this discussion here. We begin from the point where this edge has reached here. When this edge reaches here up to the point where this edge reaches here, there is an increase of area and the area goes to a maximum when this whole rectangle overlaps with this rectangle here. Afterwards, this edge begins to move away and this edge starts to approach this one, when there is a linear decrease. What is the maximum area? The maximum area is when these two rectangles overlap entirely and that area is of course, pi by 2 multiplied by 1. So, we have the following shape for the convolution. So, the d t f t of x 1 n times x 2 n would look like this. It would start when omega plus pi by 4 is equal to minus pi by 4 or omega is equal to minus pi by 2 and it would end when omega minus pi by 4 
is equal to plus pi by 4 or omega is equal to plus pi by 2. At 0, it would take the maximum that is when omega plus pi by 4 is equal to pi by 4. There would be a linear increase here and a linear drop there and this height reached would be pi by 2. This is how the DTFT would look. Now, you know this so called dual result that we have here is very important later when we talk about the effect of windowing on sequences or when we try to design finite impulse response filters with windows. We shall gain a lot of insight into what happens when we truncate an impulse response by using this idea of multiplication of sequences. So, it is not without application or without reason that we are discussing this property. Anyway, so much so for that property, but this property at the moment gives us something equally valuable and interesting. Let us write it down. Yes, there is a question. That is right. That, that is a very good question. So, the question is here we did not run into any trouble or we you know the whole convolution became easier because two rectangles did not overlap at once. You know the, the, each of those DTFTs is periodic. So, what we said is I left it to you as an exercise to show that when one of the rectangles was interacting with the basic rectangle between minus pi and pi, no other rectangle interfered because the other rectangle was too far away. What would happen if this were not the case? Well, if this were not the case, you have to account for rectangles that come at once carefully. So, in fact, that is a very good question and let me leave it to you as an exercise to do the following. Exercise, let the two DTFTs x 1 to omega take the following form. Let them be one between minus three pi by four and plus three pi by four. And of course, angle is zero. They are zero phase. And of course, you know that x one and two have the DTFT capital X 1 and 2 as before. The exercise is obtain the DTFT of X 1 n X 2 n. And in fact, I will also leave it to you as an exercise to show that x 1 or 2 n comes out to be sin 3 pi by 4 n by pi n for n not equal to 0 and 3 pi by 4 by pi for n equal to 0. Anyway, here when we do this exercise, we will have to worry about more than one rectangle overlapping at once. So, you have to carefully account for the rectangles that would overlap with the basic rectangle each time you move. 